I'm going to be talking about trees and liability. So I'm going to do a, a sort of a very quick jaunt through trees and stuff that they do. Uh, so I think we can take it as read that trees are a good thing. People love trees, apart from when they're in their back garden causing a problem. But otherwise, trees are a good thing. Uh, we know their benefits. They have amenity value, carbon dioxide absorption, uh, create shade and cooling, and all sorts of wonderful things trees do. So uh, I probably don't need to say any more about that, but trees also can be a problem. Uh, let's click the wrong way. So I'm going to talk to you today about tree issues, when trees are a bit of a nuisance. Um, so tree roots are, uh, we've already heard a bit about tree roots when it comes to subsidence. Um, and uh, there is two ways in which roots can cause damage to structures. One is direct damage, that is a root comes into contact with some sort of structure, presses against it, and as it grows, then distorts that structure. That's called direct damage. And then you've got an indirect damage. Uh, so it's not the root directly doing something, but it's mediated through the soil. So subsidence mediated through shrinkable clay soils. And then I'm going to talk to you about trees falling over. And we're going to see some nice pictures of uh, collapsed trees. And, uh, but that is a problem, of course, when the tree lands on property cars, people, um, and can result in litigation, of course, to try and get compensation. So we're starting off with direct damage. Here's a nice picture of somebody's block paved drive, and uh, they're complaining that a tree has caused their drive to be distorted. And you can see that it's all rucked all over the place. Um, and uh, if I pick up this one here and press a button, I can point um, so here, uh, there is a root, um, and it's fairly obvious, I think, that there are roots um, underneath the rest. Now, on the bottom left-hand side, um, you've got some numbers, 500 to 900 kilopascals, which uh, is 73 to 130 pounds per square inch, um, which is the pressure that has been measured that roots can exert on their surroundings. So it's turga pressure is one way of describing it. Um, if you pump up your car tyre, you know that it's about 30 to 35 pounds per square inch. So roots can uh, ex exert quite a significant pressure on the outside world, um, uh, so, but it's sufficient to lift uh, bricks like that, uh, block paving. It is sufficient to distort uh, tarmac um, and low loaded brick walls, but you can't lift a house with a tree root. So let's rule that out. A house is too heavy. So when people ring you up or ring me up and say, there's a tree beside my house, I'm worried that the root is going to somehow disturb it by lifting, uh, hydraulically jacking up the house. No, that doesn't happen. Uh, so we can uh, set that one aside. There is uh, a close-up of the uh, root lifting the paving. And legally speaking, if that root came from a neighbour's tree, that is a nuisance. That's a legal technical term, an interference with a person's use or enjoyment of their land. And potentially there could be a claim um, if it can be demonstrated all the tests, foreseeability, negligence and so on. Um, there's a picture of a nice giant redwood, uh, Wellingtonia. Um, so I'm taking the picture from the garden, the pathway beside that red brick house and uh, the giant redwood is in a neighbouring garden. They're complaining of distortion of their um, crazy paved pathway down the side of the house, which you can see is not as it ought to be. So they uh, commissioned uh, a firm of arboriculturists to take up the paving to use some uh, a jet of air to blow away the fairly sandy soil to reveal these massive roots. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong impression that all tree roots are like that, because they're not. Most tree roots are small. But giant redwoods have the capacity to produce thick roots that spread for long distances at fairly shallow depth. And uh, so I was asked the question, so what do you do about that? Do you chop the roots off? Well, that's one option. Might not be that 
great for the tree? Um, do you create some kind of uh, cage around the roots to confine them and then relay the path, which is another option, but expensive. So there are various questions about that, but it's a problem that needs to be solved somehow. Um, and damage to walls is another issue because people don't want to have trees right next to the house. They want them to be next to the neighbor's house <laughs> uh, so they don't get too shaded. So usually, Frequently, trees are planted next to the boundary wall. And here's a cedar. It's got a tree preservation order, which means you can't do anything to the tree without the council's permission. And it's right next to that wall. So looking next door, um, there's a nice crack in the wall. And I was called in to investigate that. Um, you can see that the wall has been uh, distorted uh, in various ways, including being pushed outwards. Um, and when I just going back a couple of slides. When I dug a little bit around the base of the tree, there was one particular root that was pressing against the foundation of the wall, which is a fairly shy foundation, but it had over time just pushed it outwards. And that's what caused that distortion. And here's another uh, example. On the other side of that fence, there is a retaining wall and there's some trees at a higher level. Um, there were, was a problem, the fence was taken down to reveal uh, the retaining wall, which was a double skin affair, and roots of a sycamore had found that there was a very tiny gap between the inner and outer layer of brick, and so the tiny roots had grown down, and over the course of a number of years, those had gradually increased radially, and with their 500 to 900 kilopascals of force, were gradually forcing the wall outwards to the point where it collapsed. And then there was a, a huge argument about who had to pay for the uh, repair of the retaining wall. <clears throat> uh, here's a, another example of a, a legal case I was involved in. Um, a crack in the boundary wall, uh, a claim against the owner of some trees that are no longer there, but uh, some ash trees that were there. Um, and uh, the allegation was it's the tree roots that have caused the crack. Um, and so I did a bit of excavation on the upper side to find out were there any roots. Uh, the stumps had already been removed, but I found that there were, including that root there, which is sort of so big, about 10 centimetres across, growing directly into the wall. Again, started off as a tiny root, but over the course of time has gradually expanded. Um, and my counterpart, acting for the defendant, said, no, it's definitely not roots even when we'd exposed this route. Anyway, eventually settled out of court and there was a payment. Um, uh, here's an example where the whole wall fell over. A line of tree cotoneasters, unless I'm a terrible arboriculturist and I've got my identification wrong, in which case you can uh, correct me. Um, but yes, again, over the course of time, there's radial expansion of the trunk and the roots. Uh, and incrementally the wall has been pushed and pushed and eventually reached a tipping point and fell over. And then there's an argument between the neighbours as to who's responsible for that. Is there a claim? Uh, it, does it fall within a six-year limitation period? When did the damage first occur? And all that sort of stuff goes on in a legal context. And then roots damaging or blocking drains is another big issue. Insurers come up against that. Um, and uh, local authorities are being asked if uh, protected trees can be felled because tree uh, roots are blocking drains or there's a, a perceived risk that they will block drains. Generally speaking, it is only older ceramic drains which may have weak points in them rather than modern plastic drains that are affected. But it's not exclusively that. But generally, if you have a plastic modern drain, roots can't get into it and therefore you won't get this kind of blockage. And root suckers, they're, they're fun. Um, some trees have the capacity to send up new trees from their roots. So they're reproducing themselves uh, in, in various ways and poplars are one of those. And again, they can produce a similar force uh, that roots can. So tarmac isn't that tricky to get through. So the, there's a, a growing shoot that's forcing its way up through the tarmac. But if you've got that happening the whole way through your car park or wherever it may be, it is a real nuisance and a problem. Um, and 
uh, who's to blame? The neighbor, it's a neighbor's tree, they cut it down, which promotes more suckering. Um, and uh, should they have known, should they have poisoned the stump? Is there, um, is there a, uh, a potential claim there? And there's a nice little eruption in the tarmac to show you. Collisions with trees, I quite like this one. Um, you may have seen it on the news a few years ago. Um, this is on King's Way, just near to King's College. Um, and uh, bus going along the bus lane struck an overhanging tree and the whole roof came off. Um, and uh, yeah, quite very significant damage. Um, you can see there there's an arrow, it says overhanging trees, two and a half metres. But yet it's a bus lane with buses that are four and a half to 4.7 metres tall. Uh, what's going on there? You can, that is the trunk of the tree that was struck. Um, and you can see that the lighter orangey areas is the actual impact of this bus. But higher up there's some older wounds which were lorries or something else hitting the tree. So it's, uh, it's had a reputation. Um, so there is a sign saying two and a half metres. Um, and then another sign which has been put up after the impact saying low trees exclamation mark don't try not to hit them um, that tree had a 12 degree lean so it's leaning over the road that's not a dangerous lean in the sense of the tree is going to fall over but it does mean that it is overhanging the carriageway I produced this little diagram to show you it was inevitable if you used the bus lane that uh, the bus was going to strike the tree uh, because, and the point of impact was at 3.35 metres above ground level and if you take into account a, a, a one degree camber then it was even more likely that there was going to be a strike at some point. Um, so here's CCTV from this incident there's the bus driver happily driving along minding his own business uh, he's, you can see on the top left hand corner he's approaching the incident tree and then a couple of seconds later ah, as there is an enormous crash uh, and breaking glass landing you can see on the bottom right hand corner um, but you can also see from the top left hand corner he was in the lane which was inevitable that he was going to hit so uh, a legal case who's to blame is it the driver is it the council for having a tree overhanging the road? Is it the people who put up the signs that weren't more specific? Don't use this lane if you're a bus. Um, that's all the kind of legal wrangling that goes on. Trip and fall. Another instance where tree roots may lift paving, tarmac and so on. And this is a case where an old lady was walking along. It was uh, 6 p.m. or so uh, in the evening in January, so it was dark. There was street lighting, but not in this particular location. Uh, she's a bit old and doddery, tripped over a route, broke her arm, and is making a claim against the council for not maintaining the pavement. So some of those succeed, some of them don't, and it all depends on the circumstances of the case. And then uh, clay shrinkage substance, which you've already heard about, and it's my particular specialism. I do a lot of uh, expert witness work in relation to uh, subsidence. So this is indirect damage and these are the kind of cracks that you might see in a building suffering from subsidence where there's differential movement. Now that is a sinkhole, that's not subsidence that I'm talking about. Um, I'm amazed that the corner of the building that is unsupported uh, hasn't cracked itself but uh, um, there are other ways in which buildings can subside, subside but I'm talking uh, about uh, clay shrinkage subsidence. And this has been in the news recently. That was the Crooked uh, House, which uh, was uh, mine workings, which had collapsed. Um, and uh, then I won't be talking to you about arson. That's for somebody else. So typical clay shrinkage subsidence damage is stepped and diagonal cracking, often at corners. Um, bay windows and so on uh, but not necessarily that um, further away from the point of subsidence the cracks may become a bit more vertical as stresses within the building are, are pulling other parts 
of the building inside then you've got damage in the plaster work again it, often a, a diagonal aspect these cracks from 2018 caused by uh, an ornamental apple tree in the pavement not far away from the front elevation but you would think a little apple tree very innocuous but in fact caused quite significant damage so how does it work clay soils shrink as they dry out swell as they re-wet um, gravel sand silt are not shrinkable therefore you can't get subsidence on those types of soils so behavior of clay soil is somewhat similar to the behavior of a spring um, if you apply a compression force to a spring it will compress and when you let go of it it'll spring back again clays are the same take out water from the clay it'll shrink put it back in again it'll swell so it has a kind of a memory it'll go back to the place it started um, and let me illustrate it in this way that's a cube of clay soil surrounded by soil all the way around and uh, I'm just going to show you what happens water is taken out by tree roots there's this soil surface and as water is sucked out that clay will shrink in all dimensions it's not just downwards it's inwards which is why often you get vertical cracks in the surface of the soil and as the summer progresses that shrinkage will get more and more severe in the winter trees are dormant rain is still happening and that the rain will percolate back into the soil causing it to swell again and typically it will always go back to the same point so we'll go down and up down and up however it may vary depending on how dry the summer is so there's some soil movement shrinkage in the summer recovery in the winter but perhaps not quite fully because it didn't rain enough a drier summer so the soil shrinks more then it recovers again less dry summer and so on so there'll be that kind of pattern that will happen with soil movement and the building will follow the same pattern because it's supported by the soil and so if you record uh, level movements in uh, level levels in a building then you may see the same sort of pattern occurring and so that's one way of detecting whether uh, the cause of damage is subsidence or not if it is subsidence you'll get the wavy pattern and if you monitor cracks the width of cracks in the building then they will get wider in the summer as the soil is drying out and they'll get narrower in the winter so it's an opposite pattern of crack movement to level movement so here's my little picture of subsidence um, Sarah's already shown you one and uh, you've got drying of the soil underneath the foundations which creates a little void and if that void is sufficient that the, uh, the in integral structure of the building can't support the weight then you will get uh, downward movement and outward rotation which is why you get the pattern of cracking that you do so it's not only the downward movement but it's also the outward rotation that occurs and the cracks step up towards the offending tree so if you've got some step diagonal cracking like that and you want to know which tree may be to blame then follow the direction that the cracks are pointing and uh, you will find the culprit so if uh, you decide to take action with the cause which is the tree uh, remove the tree then over winter you'll get recovery of the soil recovery of the building and that will be the end of the story if you keep the tree then the story may be longer um, <clears throat> now uh, we've heard about changing climate and that summers are getting hotter and drier so you would imagine that the numbers of substance claims would be escalating in fact uh, the peak was in about 1990-91 in terms of the numbers of claims and the cost of those claims there were also peaks in 2003 and 2006 but since then there's been a gradual decline in numbers of claims and costs and my graph ends in 2018 when you've got an upswing but uh, compared to the peak of 60,000 claims in 2018 it was more like 24,000 claims so less than half and again in 2022 hot dry summer about 24,000 claims so yes the numbers go up in hot dry summers but they are not there's not an escalating upward trend 
surprisingly, the trend is downwards. So fewer trees overall are implicated in causing subsidence. 2022, starting in the middle, uh, this is uh, Met Office rainfall data. Um, so May, June, July, August, and uh, no, that must be April, May, June, July, August, and virtually no rain, very hot temperatures, and therefore soils will dry out very quickly, and did. Um, this is Morex data, meteorolo meteorological office rainfall, and evaporation calculation system, which tells you the deficit in the soil, how much water has been taken out that needs to be put back. And uh, it peaks just over 300 millimetres of water, and 2018 is the red line, so it hit the ceiling, as it were, fairly quickly. And 2022, similar, the black line, similar pattern, hitting a peak of soil moisture deficit. And those two years were event summers, uh, known as surge years in the industry, where numbers of substance claims are definitely going to go up. Uh, this is some level monitoring data. So on the left-hand side, it's millimetres of movement. Date along the bottom, so I'm just going to pick one line. So these are uh, points around a building that are being monitored with a, an optic level. The uh, monitoring didn't start till the 4th of January, and uh, so that's into the winter recovery period. So you've got some upward movement of the building as the clay soil is swelling. In 2021, uh, you've got some downward movement of about what should we say, four millimetres, so not an incredible amount of movement. And then in the winter, building recovers again. But when you get to 20, summer 2022, it nosedives off a cliff, so to speak. So hot, dry summer, the magnitude of that movement increases very, very dramatically. Um, so now you've got something like 20 millimetres or more of foundation movement, which will result in cracks that are probably a centimetre, centimetre and a half wide. So 2021, a fairly benign summer as, as uh, substance goes, but 2022, an event summer, because it was so hot and so dry. Now, people often ask me the question, surely buildings are going to subside in any event because it's hot and it's dry. But the answer to that is in this graph. There's a black line, a green line and a red line. Red line is moisture evaporation just from the soil surface with nothing there. And uh, not much happens. And you don't get drying below foundations. Then you've got grass, which is the green line, which can cause about a, a deficit of about 100 millimetres of water. But that doesn't go down below a depth of about one metre. And most houses have foundations the deeper the metre. But trees, the black line, cause massive desiccation and at significant depth. So an oak tree, for example, can cause desiccation, which is a technical term for soil drying caused by trees. Um, so an oak tree, uh, what was I going to say about an oak tree? Forgotten. Uh, oh yes, oak trees can cause drying down to four metres, uh, on some occasions five metres. Um, so this is some data... Uh, from 2018, which shows the distribution of uh, substance claims from a particular insurer. And uh, it's normally subsidence in, in an ordinary year is in the southeast, but that shows that it's spread further north and further west. And 2022 from Orga, who do site investigations, that's their um, data showing that there's a spread across the country. So spreading further west, further north. In London, uh, this is London boroughs, and the redder it is, the higher the risk, um, because you've got much more shrinkable soils. Around the River Thames, you've got sands and gravels, which are non-shrinkable, and so a lower level of risk. Um, the Telegraph tells us, don't have any trees near your property, because they're going to cause subsidence, which is nonsense, because uh, all sorts of tr properties have trees near them, and subsidence doesn't occur. Uh, but some data from insurers suggests that um, the majority of cases, the tree is closer than 10 metres away. So maybe 10 metres can be regarded as a safe distance. Closer than that, maybe you're verging on to being a bit riskier, dicing with subsidence. Um, so uh, Sarah has told us about 
causation, how, how do you establish that? You can monitor cracks and see if you get a pattern. You can look at the uh, orientation of the cracks. Are they stepped and diagonal? Um, dig a trial pit or pits to see what is happening. How deep are the foundations? Are there any roots? Uh, what roots are there? Soil tests to tell you, is it a clay? So the plasticity index will tell you if it's a clay or not. Um, and anything more than 40 in that column indicates a highly shrinkable clay. And the higher the number is, the more shrinkable it is. So that is a clay. And then you've got soil sample suction, which tells you how dry that clay is. And there's a table at the bottom from the building research establishment, uh, which suggests that uh, you've got very severe desiccation at two and a half meters and three and a half meters, which doesn't occur. You don't get those values unless tree roots have been doing their thing. There is another test you can do uh, called the uh, Driscoll test, uh, but soil suction is better. And then uh, roots will be sent off to a laboratory to identify where they come from, which tree species, and this one is from either Quercus or Castanea, so oak or sweet chestnut. They're sort of related. Um, monitoring of cracks is done by usually having three studs and measuring the distance between each of them, with the D being a control. And here's a graph of some crack monitoring. So millimetres of movement uh, on the left-hand side date, and what it's showing you is that from the opening point, you've got minus numbers, which suggests, which indicates that the crack is closing, uh, which is what you would expect in winter. And then in summer, it opens again. And that crack has gone from about minus eight to plus 12 or something. So it's now two centimeters wide at the end of the summer, 2003. And level monitoring, that's a graph of what it looks like over the course of time. And again, what you've got for the black line here is recovery. The building's moving upward as the soil rehydrates in the winter and then plunges down again in the summer. So that's good evidence that the tree is to blame uh, if you see that cyclical pattern. And uh, this may or may not be helpful to you, but Giles Biddle um, who's here, to, here today, uh, was instrumental in, in promoting level monitoring and showing isometric drawings to show the, the degree of distortion in a building. So here's an, an example of one of mine. And the way that I do that, the black line is uh, if the building was level, but the monitoring showed that it wasn't, it was going down and up. So the amplitude of that movement I plotted and then in my mind's eye, what I'm doing is I'm at the highest point, which looks like nine here. I put a marble in there and the marble rolls down here, rolls down here and goes kaplunk at number four. And it also go, rolls down here and rolls and goes kaplunk at number one, which means that this part of the building is moving and so is this. So we've got movement at the front, movement at the back. Uh, yet assuming that three to six is the front of the building, which is very useful in diagnosing which tree is to blame. And here's another example. If I put my marble in, it's going to land at number nine. And so if you draw an arrow through the lowest point, it points towards the probable culprit. Um, and arboriculturists will go along and identify which trees uh, are at that location. So here it says it's an oak, T2 oak, and therefore we'd like you to remove it, please. So uh, that's the investigations, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go through this now very quickly. Uh, in order for a claim to be successful, there's got to be reasonable foreseeability. And the courts are looking at whether this, po this tree poses a real risk as opposed to just a possible risk. So let's leave substance behind and talk about trees falling over. Um, so it's a bit bad sometimes. If the tree falls over in the forest, nobody is particularly bothered, but if it falls over where people are, it's bad. Um, damage to property in various ways. Um, so a duty of care is owed by tree owners to people that it may be affected if a tree were to fall or break. A tree owner therefore needs to be aware 
of the condition of their trees. So here is a tree um, and uh, a property. It, that oak tree looks absolutely fine. You, so maybe you'd be forgiven for thinking it's okay. But then a storm comes along and the whole thing breaks apart, apart and bits of it land on a house. Was it possible to tell in advance that that tree was going to do that? Well, in this instance, yes, because that thing that's in the picture is a fungus. Uh, it's called Ganoderma, and uh, that's the external sign that there is internal decay. So it's a, a signal that there is rot in the tree. And if there's rot in the tree, there's a potential for it to break. Here's another example of a cedar falling over, causing lots and lots of damage. Uh, to a, a swimming pool and there's the remains of the cedar and when I climbed up that ladder what I saw was cubical brown rot. Uh, so almost the entire uh, cross section of the tree was completely rotten and just left this friable crumbly stuff. The fungus Latiparus sulfurius caused that. Was it possible to tell? Yes, in advance because if you tapped the base of the tree instead of going uh, well, I don't know, how do you describe a sound? Anyway, boing, 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 like you're tapping a drum, which is a good sign. It's hollow on the inside. So if uh, a competent inspection had been carried out, you'd have been able to tell that tree was going to fall over. And here are various signs that tree inspectors like me and some others here are looking for to see whether a tree might pose a real risk of failure. And this publication, Common Sense Risk Management of Trees, sets out what tree owners ought to do. So if you're a homeowner, go and check your trees every year. If you're a larger landowner, you need to employ somebody, most likely, to go around and check trees every year. Tree uh, deaths, uh, deaths caused, caused by trees are very rare, so uh, around about six per year. So not, uh, trees pose a very low risk in general. Um, so here's a legal case where a branch of a beech tree fell on a group of children and killed one of them, injured some others. And uh, so the National Trust who owned the tree and the estate were sued. And the question was, uh, were they to blame? Was it a foreseeable risk? Was uh, the National Trust negligent? Um, well, there had been regular inspections of trees on the estate, um, but the defect that caused that branch to fail wasn't visible from ground level. Um, and it was considered not reasonable to do a climbed inspection because if you're climbing 250,000 trees, you'd never complete the job because it was to be too onerous and too expensive. So uh, it was regarded that there was a reasonable system in place that the inspection had been reasonable, it's proper to do it from ground level, not hiking up the tree, and therefore the claimant, sadly, was unsuccessful. And I'm going to close with a few comments on this uh, fairly recent legal case, Hoyle versus Hampshire County Council, and tree surveys and Ed Power. So Hampshire County Council man manage and own lots of trees. Uh, a lot of them are beside roads. Um, they contracted out their surveying to tree surveys and tree surveys in turn contracted out their surveying to an individual surveyor, Ed Power. So they were all sued. Um, so the instance here was on 6th of June, David Hoyle, 2017, uh, David Hoyle was tragically and fatally injured when his car was struck by a cherry tree. Now, the cruel irony is that uh, David Hoyle had devoted his life to protecting African forests and natural ecosystems. Um, and so, doubly sad. The incident was uh, preceded by heavy rain and strong winds. Uh, here's a Google Street View image of the tree 572 and its neighbour 575. And it had been inspected by Hampshire County Council's highway surveyor. This was in-house surveyors on the 10th of February 2016. And again for the countryside service on the 22nd of November 2016. And Ed Power was the man who conducted that survey. And that was seven months before the tree collapsed. Uh, Hampshire's countryside service were going to survey 23,000 trees. So that's a lot of trees. 
a lot of work to do. And record every one. So that's a lot of detailed work. So 572 was recorded as being mature, having a trunk diameter of 450 to 600 millimetres, 15 to 20 metres tall, and then a crown spread of 10 to 15 metres. There is the remains of the tree, which had uprooted, and then once the top of the tree had been cut off, it just fell back into its place again. Um, so the maintenance requirement recorded was remove dead wood over 25 millimetres diameter, crown lift over the highway, and monitor basal area annually. And then considerations, lower crown, lower crown encroaching onto highway with deadwood throughout, tree growing on ditch embankment with exposed roots. So it was next to a shallow ditch and there were some roots seen to be growing down the side of the ditch. Um, so the surveyor said, uh, whoever comes along next just needs to check that the ditch hasn't been cleared, which might cut off some roots. There were no fungal fruiting bodies, no cavities, no obvious decay at ground level. Uh, he filled in a um, priority rating. He said that uh, the failure of the tree was somewhat likely, and if it failed, it was likely to cause damage, which gave it a score of six. So that's a priority rating, not a risk rating. So which trees do you tend to first? So priority 16 work carried out first, then 12 and 9 and so on. And at the time the tree fell over, Work had been completed on 16s and was underway on 12, uh, but they hadn't got to the 6s yet. So the claimants pleaded case from their tree expert who advised was that there was severe crown imbalance over the dual carriageway. So the tree was one-sided, so to speak, with its branch structure. And that was an obvious hazard. And also that the tree had an asymmetrical root system as roots would not have grown underneath the historic ditch. So very adamant that there would be no roots under the ditch. Thus, because of those two things, the priority score should have been 12 or 16 and not 6. The defendant's case, and I was representing one of two experts representing the defendants. I was representing Ed Power and Tree Surveys. Um, so the defendant said the tree did have an asymmetrical crown, somewhat asymmetrical, but that's a natural feature of trees on a wooded edge, so that's not an obvious hazard, that's just a normal thing that trees do. It doesn't make them dangerous. And woody roots were visibly growing down the side of the shallow, undisturbed ditch and were likely to have grown underneath it. So we didn't agree that there was no way that roots could grow under the ditch. We thought the likelihood is that they would have. And in the absence of any evidence of disturbance of the ditch or damage to roots, there was no need to probe the ditch. Uh, the claimant's expert said uh, any competent tree uh, surveyor should get into the ditch, should scuff around with his boots and should poke with some kind of screwdriver or something to find out if there were any roots there. Um, and the judge eventually didn't accept that that was what should have been done. So here's what the judge did have to say. I'm sorry, I'm, over, I'm overrunning. Two more minutes. Is that all right? Or should I just stop now? <laughs> Two more minutes and then you can have your uh, coffee. So the claimant's expert evidence in court was not as he had set out in the report that the tree had severe crown asymmetry, which was an obvious defect. So the claimant's expert moderated his view and the judge picked up on that and said, well, you were very adamant about this outside of court and now you're moderating your view. So that's not what you're supposed to do. He appeared to align much more with the defendants experts that many trees have asymmetrical crowns and they're unlikely to be hazardous because of that feature. And whether an inspector should get into a ditch or not seemed to me on the evidence to be driven by whether there was a potential issue with the tree. Here the inspector didn't see an issue. There is no literature to support the requirement for minor excavations on a visual tree inspection. So I was happy with that judgment because I don't think tree inspectors should be jumping in ditches and kicking around and poking to find roots. Insofar as the claim has been founded on the fact of lack of structural roots to the south of the tree, this is incorrect because there were visible roots, plainly. In my view, the evidence does not support the claimant's case that tree 572 was structurally defective at all. The evidence points strongly to the visual assessment not only being competent but having been conducted with care. It is understandable that David Hoyle's family seek liability against the defendants, but whilst understanding the claimant's desire for compensation for such a loss, it would require the defendants to have done more than was reasonable 
to ensure safe tree-lined roads. Requiring a greater risk-averse approach would result in unnecessary removal of trees and accompanying destruction of habitats. So that seems to me like a sensible, balanced uh, response. I cannot find the defendants negligent or in breach of their duty in relation to this terrible moment on the 6th of June 2017. It was a tragedy. Where I'm satisfied, no one was to blame. And conclusion, so I am finishing now. Sorry for overrunning. The duty of a, landover, a landowner is not open-ended. A competent visual check for obvious defects is adequate. Crown and root asymmetry are regarded as being normal characteristics of a tree rather than an obvious hazard. And a risk-averse approach to tree safety is not endorsed by the courts. Um, one final comment. Ed Power who was a tree surveyor, um, it's sad for him as well as the, the family who suffered a bereavement because the stress of this court case hanging over him meant that he left the industry thinking, I'm never going to inspect a tree again because he felt he'd done a competent inspection but yet was being accused himself in court of doing a bad job. Um, so he, he left the industry but was vindicated by the judge. So obviously happy about that. So thanks for your attention. Sorry for overrunning. Um, enjoy your coffee.